successo? Bene, well, uh, il sogno è stato ancora arrivato, people are coming, but we are, we are going to begin and I will ask uh, the dean of the faculty and our rector to give some welcome address that are always needed in important conferences. Um, May I introduce the dean of the faculty, Professor Michele Massonetti? Professor, the faculty is the school of the The dean of the School of Humanities. There is no faculty, The dean of the School of Humanities, who is, by the way, a philosopher. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I'm very glad to, uh, to, to, to give my uh, welcome address. Uh, uh, as Dean of the School of Humanities at the University of Genoa. Really sorry, I will be short because I have another conference going on and I have to uh, give the welcome speech uh, even, even there. Uh, in introducing this uh, International CIFA midterm conference, I'd like to thank both foreign and Italian speakers who are here with us today. This is not the first CIFA conference held in Genoa. We have had many of them, thanks to, especially to Carlo Penco, who is very active in this society. I remember some years ago a conference entitled Latin Meeting in Analytic Philosophy, which was quite interesting because it was organized, as it happens today, by Carlo Penco, and we had, in that case, many representatives of Latin countries active in analytic philosophy which is uh, gaining strength uh, today uh, because it's uh, very widespread, uh, even in countries like Italy, uh, which have uh, a different philosophical tradition. In Italy, idealism and uh, history of philosophy in, uh, in, in neo aristotelian sense are, uh, are, more, are, are very popular. But today, as I said, I think philosophy is gaining strength. Uh, and. Uh, I think that meetings of this kind are very important because they provide uh, Italian analytic philosophers uh, with uh, the opportunity to confront their researches and uh, to listen to what foreign analytic philosophers have to say. Uh, well, of course, analytic philosophers are very international. They, they, they uh, hold a lot of meetings in Italy and abroad, so uh, they are more uh, inclined to go abroad uh, uh, with uh, comparison with other uh, to represent the other, other philosophical traditions. Uh, I'm very glad also because we have the conference in this beautiful room, as you can see. This is the Aula Magna of the School of Humanities, and we have uh, uh, the original paintings of the Genoese uh, painters of the 15th and 16th century. I think this is the ideal place uh, for talking and discuss philosophical issues. It is interesting to note, by the way, that the title of the conference is uh, Individuals and Collectivities, a, a theme which is relevant for uh, uh, political philosophy, social philosophy, methodology of the human sciences, and many other fields. And uh, quickly reading the, the abstracts, uh, I found the themes that are central from my, uh, from my own viewpoint. For example, the attempts to explain the so-called original intentionality, with reference to Wilfrid Sellers' uh, myth of the given. Uh, Bob Brandon's the thesis of the, uh, that inference is the most relevant feature of our worldview. And uh, last but not least, the relations between the subjectivity, objectivity, and intersubjectivity in a Salazian, in both a Salazian and a Tenizonian uh, fashion. I don't want to steal time to the speakers, and as a matter of fact, as I said, I have another conference right now. Let me just mention that the conference is financially supported, not only financially, even culturally supported by. Uh, uh, the Genoa uh, section of the Italian National Project PRIM, the, the problem of indeterminacy, meaning, knowledge, and action. Both me, Capo Benco, and other people are in this uh, group, which have, has been the, the only Italian philosophical group which uh, worked uh, in the, in the, in the two, 2015, I think. Just the, so I am very glad about that. And the word thank is uh, also due to the epistemological section of uh, our department, which is 
not, which is no longer the Department of Philosophy, unfortunately, it is the Department of Philosophy, History, uh, Classical Studies, uh, and many other things. Uh, but you know, this is the situation now. And uh, so, uh, a warm uh, thank to Carlo Pinko, uh, who is always active in organizing this conference, and uh, to all young researchers who are uh, in, char in, uh, in charge of the organization. So, uh, I'm sorry for uh, because I have to go, and I, I wish you a very a good day and a very good day of work. Thank you very much. Well, this is the Italian Society for a Philosopher. To preserve linguistic diversity, I would ask the director to speak in Italian to remember people that we are in Italy. So, if you may. Così come le mie capacità di fare ricerca, ma eh, ci tenevo a essere qui per l'amicizia che mi lega a Carlo Pecco e poi perché sono un ex socio e spero di essere in futuro, fra qualche anno, quando smetterò di fare il rettore, di nuovo socio della Società Italiana di Filosofia Sanitica. Io appartengo a quel, a quel settore, a quei cugini eh, della filosofia analitica, del filone principale della filosofia analitica che è la filosofia analitica del diritto. So che in passato, ricordo, nel passato c'era una maggiore interazione forse tra eh, questo settore di studi e gli studi filosofici, forse adesso ce n'è un po' meno per ragioni varie. Eh, L'unico contributo che posso aver dato in qualche modo da rettore al riavvicinamento di questi studi è stato di dislocare il la sezione in cui sta Carlo Pecco di epistemologia di filosofia analitica nello stesso edificio in cui ci si svolgono le attività dei filosofi del diritto così che la vicinanza fisica forse riuscirà a superare qualche distanza metodologica che in passato, passato c'è stata. Devo dire che il tema che tratterete in queste due giornate, che io purtroppo non vi potrò seguire per gli impegni di altro genere, molto più noiosi che ho, è uno di quei temi che appassionano anche la filosofia del diritto eh, perché sono collegati ad esempio al dibattito, è un, soltanto un'articolazione di quello di cui voi vi occuperete, al dibattito ad esempio sulla titolarità dei diritti, dei diritti Politici, oltre che diritti morali e politici, ci può essere una titolarità collettiva dei diritti o può esserci soltanto un esercizio collettivo dei diritti di proprietà individuale. Sono temi che sono stati dibattuti a lungo all'interno della filosofia politica ma anche della filosofia giuridica. Come spesso succede in questi casi, eh, non si è arrivati a un consenso su questo punto, neppure a livello dottrinale. Eh, ma si è avanzato nella conoscenza, nel senso che oggi abbiamo eh, una, una analisi, possediamo delle analisi su questa tematica molto più raffinate rispetto a quelle degli inizi del dibattito tra liberali e comunitaristi eh, degli anni 90. Bene, io non voglio togliere altro tempo al vostro dibattito, quindi vi auguro buon lavoro, spero, spero, è una promessa che faccio a me stesso di ritornare fra qualche anno insieme a voi a discutere di scienza e semplicemente di logistica.
I'm not particular into the philosophy of language. On the other hand, I am a philosopher of language who was invited to this conference, uh, for which I'm grateful to the organizer, to Carlo Benko, and uh, to Lucifa. So I thought I would try uh, and choose a topic that, though strictly a topic in the philosophy of language, may be of some uh, side interest to political philosophers, uh, social philosophers, and so forth, namely the topic of normativity. Uh, this is called anti-anti-normativity, which does not amount to uh, normativity, uh, because I would like to raise objections about uh, uh, certain accounts of semantics that are strongly opposed to the idea that meaning is a normative notion, which used to be standard until a few decades ago. Meaning has been taken uh, to be uh, a normative notion, uh, i.e. that uh, an expression E has a certain meaning, for example, that it means what cat means in English, entails that it ought to be used in a certain way. For example, that it ought to be applied only to cats, i.e. used to refer to cats, uh, only to cats. So, from the premise that an expression means cat, I will use these capital letters uh, just to express uh, what could be paraphrased as means what the word cat means in English, in standard English. Now, uh, some people use that to mean uh, expression e, uh, means the concept cat or expresses the concept cat or something like that. I will disregard that entirely. But people who, uh, who believe in concepts, I don't know personally, but people who believe in concepts may like to read this as uh, expression E means the concept cat. Anyway, if E means cat, then E ought to be applied only to cats. This follows. This is an inference, uh, an accepted inference. Now, sometimes the claim has been stronger than this. The claim has been that if an expression means cat, that is to say, that E means cat amounts to say that E ought to be used in a certain way. But for the purposes of the present discussion, the weaker formulation will, will, do, will be enough. Now, uh, such claims about the normativity of meaning are aware often brought back to Wittgenstein's later philosophy. Wittgenstein held that speaking a language, or writing a language, etc., amounted to participated in a kind of game characterized by certain rules, and if one did not abide by the rules, one was not playing that game. Maybe he was playing another game, but not that game. Then the rules specified how linguistic expressions such as red or cat, were to be used by the players. There was no overarching obligation to take part in the game. However, if one wished to count as a player, then one had to play by the rule. Uh, this is a uh, often mentioned quotation. If you follow other rules than those of chess, you are playing another game. And if you follow grammatical rules other than such and such ones, that does not mean you say something wrong. No, you are speaking of something else. Now, the way Wittgenstein uses the expression grammatical rules, uh, he doesn't mean uh, just, say, rules of syntax, as we uh, usually do nowadays. He, may, he, he means something more uh, comprehensive than that is semantic, what we call semantic characterization, semantic rules and so on, would be grammatical rules for Wittgenstein. So grammatical rules means rules of language in general, whatever they may be. Now, Wittgenstein uh, is also uh, very well known for having 
assert that, that for a large class of cases of the employment of the word meaning, though not for all, the word can be explained in this way. The meaning of a word is its use in the language. Now, there are qualifications in this formulation of the philosophical investigations, uh, but in spite of such qualifications, Wittgenstein was just saddled with the claim that simply meaning is used. Now, use is a fact, or a bunch of facts, a really big bunch of facts, actually. Now, how can meaning be both a fact and a prescriptive rule for the employment of an expression, i.e. a norm? Seems that on the one hand, meaning is a norm, on the other hand, it is a fact. Now, uh, ultimately, uh, I will claim that this is exactly the way it is, in a sense. That is, uh, the notion of meaning something has both a descriptive content and a normative content. But there are other philosophers who decided otherwise. They decided to uh, cut the knot and just deny that meaning is a normative notion. And these people are called, or I call them, uh, the anti-normativists. Examples are Osa Bigfors, Anandi Hatiangadi, and Catherine Luer. Just by coincidence, they are all women. Uh, I don't see why women uh, ought to be particularly hostile to uh, a normative conception of meaning in principle, but as a matter of fact, these are all women. Uh, fortunately, there will be a man involved as well, uh, as we shall see uh, in a moment. Anyway, <coughs> they say things like the following. There is no reason to subscribe to the idea that meaning is an essentially normative notion. Now, I underline the essentially uh, to uh, emphasize that it sort of qualifies the assertion that meaning is not a normative notion. Uh, she doesn't say just that. She says it is not an essentially normative notion. And likewise, uh, Hakan Gadi, we have no good reason to believe that meaning is normative in a sense that justifies a presumption against naturalism, with, which seems to uh, implicate that may be, may, there may be another sense in which meaning uh, may be normative. And Paul Horwitz uh, agrees with uh, Hatian Ghani and Bigfoss uh, to some extent, though his qualifications are even stronger. Though meaning is not intrinsically normative, it does have normative implications. So meaning is not a normative notion, it is not in inherently normative, but it does have normative implications. Now, what I will do now is the following. I will uh, quickly present uh, what I take to be the uh, standard anti-normativist argument as presented by both Wigfors and Hatian Gadi in somewhat different versions, which I will disregard. Then I will again uh, rather rapidly express, uh, express some qualms I have concerning this argument, but that is not really my topic today. My topic today is uh, Horwitz, the particular form of uh, anti-normativism that Horwitz supports, and uh, certain con consequences one can draw by working on Horwich's formulation. So this is just, uh, it has an informative purpose. I would like you to know what these people uh, usually say. Uh, what's their argument for meaning not being a normative notion? So they start by supposing that it is a normative notion. Suppose there is a norm to the fact that if S, a speaker, means can't, by the word can't, then S is under an obligation to call only cats cat. So suppose things are as these two ladies suppose that the normativists uh, believe it to be. 
Now, there are cases in which one is under no such obligation. For example, suppose that for some reason, in order to save a human life, I uh, should say that that the chair here in front of me is a tiger. Suppose this it comes to the crazy circumstance in which that could have the effect uh, of saving a human life, whereas calling that a chair would have the opposite effect of endangering a human life. Now, uh, rather plausibly, uh, these authors say that in such circumstances I would be under no obligation of calling that a chair. Indeed, I would have a, a different obligation. If I had to call it a tiger, then I would call it a tiger in order to save a human life. Now, these cases in which uh, the obligation to call only cats cat does not hold are cases in which one is under no obligation to tell the truth. For the truth norm, i.e. the norm that uh, says uh, you ought to tell the truth, the truth norm is suspended or overridden by a prevailing norm. For example, the norm uh, you ought to save a human life whatever, whenever it is possible for you to do so. Now, if cases in which the obligation at one fails are exactly the cases in which the truth norm is suspended or overridden, then the obligation at issue depends on the truth norm, and no specifically semantic norm is involved. So the point these authors want uh, to make is not so much that uh, Wittgenstein's inference is invalid, that is the inference from uh, X means cat to X ought to be applied only to cat is invalid. They don't want to say that. What they want to say is that uh, the inference is valid because of the normal truth, not because of something mysterious called the semantic norm. It is valid because Ceter is paribus, we ought to tell the truth. And when that is not the case, when we are, not, we are under no obligation of telling the truth, then the consequence doesn't fall. It is not the case that I ought to go only cats, cat. Now, uh, I will mention two misgivings I have uh, with this uh, argument. Uh, misgiving one. This is, of course, uh, the formulation of the semantic norm, of the alleged semantic norm that these authors use, that is, if a speaker means cat by the word cat, then the speaker is under an obligation to call only cat's cat. Now, is this the proper formulation of the alleged semantic norm? Suppose a speaker S is under the delusion that the word transvestite means disguised. That is, that it means what the word disguised means in standard, in standard English. And she uses the word accordingly. Or, in other words, suppose that S means disguised by transvestite. Certainly, S would have the disposition to apply transvestite to people in disguise. But should we say that S is under an obligation to apply transvestite only to disguised people? My answer is no, we shouldn't say that. And even less would we say that the obligation to apply transvestite only to disguised people follows from the norm of truth as the anti-normativists believe. Because the norm of truth prescribes one to tell the truth, not to tell what, what one believes to be the truth, even though, of course, one can try to obey the norm only by telling what one believes to be the truth. But that is not what the norm of truth itself says. So it appears that semantic obligations are engendered, if at all, 
by communitarian meaning, not by ideological meaning. That is, ideological meaning does not generate obligations. Whereas, of course, the anti-normativist argument uh, is based on formulation on top, which is an ideological formulation of semantic normativity. Now, this, of course, you, some of you will know that this particular formulation comes from uh, Klinke's uh, essay, Wittgenstein on, on rule and private language, made very popular the formulation uh, of above. Uh, and there, uh, S uh, means the addition by the sign plus. That was uh, what Klinke uh, discussed in that famous essay. That was justified by the, by the context. I'm not. Uh, I don't want to 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 say anything about uh, the formulation in itself and particularly the way to be used that formulation. But in this general context, in my opinion, it is not the, the appropriate formulation or the semantic norm to use. Second misgiving. There may be something circular to the anti-normativist argument. What the argument shows, uh, or purports to show, is that if a speaker means cat by cat, then the speaker ought to apply cat only to cat, uh, only to cats, only if the speaker intends to tell the truth or is under an obligation to tell the truth. Different anti-normativists use different formulations here, but that doesn't make any difference for my purpose. Or, in other words, this is logically equivalent, if S means cat by cat and S intends to tell the truth, or is under an obligation to tell the truth, then S ought to apply cat only to cats. It's just important, important the antecedent. Moreover, it is purported by the anti-normativist that if S means cat by cat and S does not intend to tell the truth, then it is not the case that S, that S ought to apply cat only to cats. So the point seems to be that meaning cat by cat and being subject to the truth norm are jointly sufficient for the obligation that I call applied, i.e. for the obligation to use the word cat only to refer to cats, Moreover, being subject to the truth norm is necessary for the obligation to hold. But obviously, meaning cat by cat is also necessary for the obligation to hold. If S does not mean cat by cat, then if S intends to tell the truth or is under an obligation to tell the truth, it is not the case that he ought to apply cat only to cats. No obligation follows. So both conditions are jointly sufficient and individually necessary for the norm applied to hold. So how does this show that the entire normative weight is carried by the truth norm? It obviously does not and cannot, unless under the assumption that meaning cat by cat itself has no normative input i.e. unless we take it for granted that meaning cat has no normative consequences, then it's purely descriptive and therefore if there is a normative consequence, there has to be a normative premise and the only normative premise around is the truth norm, so the normative weight is carried by the truth norm. But that is only legitimate, that conclusion can only be reached by presupposing that meaning cat itself has no normative input, which is exactly what these people want to prove. So it cannot be assumed, which may, seems to make the argument secular. Anyway, as I said, I am really interested today in uh, Horwich's view, uh, which is, as I already mentioned, that Though meaning is not inherently normative, facts about meaning, for example, that cat means whatever it means in English, have certain normative implications. What does Horwich mean by this? Oh, well, for example, 
If S means by can't what, what it means, I can't, then S ought to desire to apply cat to cats and only to cats. This is one statement. Moreover, if S means cat by cat, then S ought to be governed by the rule R cat. Uh, R cat is an idealized description of what is supposed to be the regular use of the word cat within the relevant linguistic community. Uh, there's an earlier statement by Horowitz in his book called Meaning, the original book on these topics of 1998, which is simpler and which I will use in the rest of this talk. I'll call it impulse. If X means cat, then X ought to be applied only to cats. This is supposed to be a true condition. It is not not claimed to be valid, it is not presented as a valid inference, it is a true condition. In this sense, Horowitz claims that meaning cat is just a fact, but it has normative consequences in the sense that this condition is true. This holds. That Impulse, this conditional holds, does not make meaning a normative notion, according to Horowitz. And in fact, that's not surprising because there are many cases of non normative facts having normative implications. For example, this is an example that Horowitz uses all the time that John killed Paul implies that John ought to be punished. But there is nothing normative about John's killing of Paul. It is just a brute fact. Yet, it has a normative consequence. And similarly with meaning. That cat means what it means, it's just a fact. That amounts, according to Horowitz, to cat being used in a certain way. The meaning of cat can be completely described by describing its use, and such a description would not require or, in, or involve any normative notions. It would be just the description of a vast number of facts eventually to be summarized by a certain rule describing a certain regularity. Rule in this sense of describing a certain regularity. Now, uh, this is a, a parenthesis. There is uh, nowadays, or there has been in the last uh, few years, a somewhat parallel debate on the normativity of logic, where the normativists about logic, for example, John McFarlane and Hartley Field and others, are exactly the philosophers who claim that logical facts have normative implications. For example, the logical fact that P and if P and Q together entail Q implies something with respect to what we ought to believe in such and such circumstances. These are the normativists. Whereas the anti-normativists, for example, in the Harman, are those who claim that no such normative consequences fall from logical facts. So, on this terminology, Horwich would qualify as a normativist about meaning, because if the normativists about logic are those that believe that logical facts have normative consequences, then normativists about meaning are those who claim that facts about meaning have normative consequences. But I will not elaborate on this. I am just uh, struck by uh, this lack of parallelism between these two cases. So let's go back to info. What if the conditional turned out to be a biconditional? That is, what if it were the case that by info holds, that is, x means cat, if and only if x ought to be applied only to cats? Good 
them that saw that meaning is a normative notion after all, because uh, meaning can, uh, is equivalent to something normative. Now, if you go back to Horwitz's example, John killed Bolt and John ought to be punished, this is not, uh, the corresponding biconditional uh, certainly does not hold. It is certainly not the case that John ought to be punished only if he killed Paul, if he robbed the national bank, or if he killed Jane, he ought to be punished as well. So, kill holds, but its converse does not. Hence, the bicondition of by kill, let's say, does not hold in this case, whereas it might in the case of meaning. But uh, many years ago, Paolo Casoleño showed me that material equivalence with a normative claim does not entail normativity. For example, suppose it were true that John ought to get a death sentence if and only if he kills someone. This in itself does not appear to make killing someone a, a normative notion. That is, killing someone remains entirely descriptive, even if we suppose this biconditional to be true. Now, I don't regard the biconditional as true because I am against the death penalty, so I don't believe that John ought to get the death penalty, even in case he killed someone. Nevertheless, a case could be made for the claim that if this biconditional is true, then it is necessarily true. For, one might argue, I'm not endorsing the argument, but it is not prima facie unacceptable, one might argue that ethical norms and values are not sensitive to differences among possible words, and neither is killing. So if the biconditional is true, it is necessarily true. But anyway, be that as it may, I would argue that contrary to the biconditional by Q, which is at best necessarily true, if true at all, the corresponding biconditional for the case of meaning is necessarily true, period. That is, it is unconditionally necessarily true. So I want to show that it is necessarily the case that X means cat if and only if X ought to be applied only to cat. To cat. <coughs> so, this is a very strong thesis. And I will do that by considering two conditionals. One is impulse and the other is its converse, con, and showing that uh, they necessarily imply each other. If impulse holds, then it con Horse and vice versa. So let's look at the first at the first implication. Suppose uh, impulse holds in some word W, whereas con doesn't. Uh, what does it mean to say that con doesn't hold at some word W? Well, for example, in W they have a language L star that has a word X that doesn't mean cat. So the consequent of con is false, but ought to be applied only to cats. So the antecedent of con is true, so con is false, whereas impul is trivially true because its antecedent is false. In this word, we are supposing impul holds, whereas con doesn't hold. So x, the word x, we are supposing to exist, doesn't mean cat. Suppose it means banana instead. It must have some meaning because it is a word of a star. We are supposing that words of a language have some meaning or other, which looks like a plausible assumption. Suppose it means banana. Then by impulse, which holds in W, it ought to be applied only to bananas. So, how could it be that he ought to be applied only to cats? Is it possible that it ought to be applied only to bananas and 
and at the same time it ought to be applied only to cases. Yes, it is possible uh, just in case when X has no application. But if X has no application, then it is not a word of a star. Uh, indeed, it is not a word of any language, because we are supposing that words have application. So, this whole, as the word W was, you know, just any, any old word, this uh, holds in every possible word. It is a necessary conditional. Let's look at the converse conditional. So, suppose uh, con holds in some word W prime, whereas input does not hold in W prime. W prime, they have a language L star prime with a word that means cat, but it is not the case that it ought to be applied only to cats. For example, uh, X may be applied to the F's as well, where the F's and the cats are disjoint sets. Say the F's are the golden retrievers, a certain breed of dogs. So in, in this word, given the existence of, of this language, con holds, there is a word that ought to be applied uh, sorry, uh, impul uh, does not hold because uh, there is a word that uh, means cat but <coughs> it's not the case that it ought to be applied only to cats impul is false whereas we are assuming that con holds Now, as con holds in W prime, and X ought to be applied only to uh, and X ought to be applied only to members of golden receivers uh, union cats, then X means golden receiver or cat because uh, con holds, but we assumed it meant cat. Now, uh, meaning cat is meaning what cat means in English, and likewise for meaning golden retriever or cat, but in English cat and golden retriever or cat are not synonymous, so there is no such word as W prime. And again, the conditional B is necessary too. So, just by logic, it follows that necessarily con, if and only if, impul, and again, just by logic, it follows that necessarily the biconditional uh, X means cat, if and only if X ought to be applied only to cats, uh, holds. So this is a necessary tool. This is the uh, proof, but forget about that. Now, Suppose we have established double star. Necessarily, X means cat if and only if X ought to be applied only to cats. What should we make of that? In particular, what about the necessary truth of the converse conditional, i.e. necessarily X ought to be applied only to cats, then X means cat. Now, if we were to follow Horowitz, if we were to reason, we were to reason here the way Horowitz reasoned for impul, we ought to say that though X ought to be applied only to cats is not itself factual, it has factual implications. For according to Horowitz, that X means cat is just a fact about the use of a certain sound. So we can have a normative premise with a factual But how can it be that if a certain norm holds, it must be true that people behave in precisely that way? Usually norms, as you teach me, are not as efficacious as that. It is certainly not, not the case that necessarily, given that one ought not to pass a red light, people do not, as a matter of fact, pass red lights. 
So perhaps it must be acknowledged that X means cat is not quite synonymous with X is used in such and such a way. X means cat is not just the description of a fact or a bunch of facts. Uh, my suggestion is that we make sense of double star by resorting to Ruth Millikan's notion of push me pull you representations. Uh, first presented by Millikan in an article that bears the name and used many times in uh, her later writings. Uh, push me pull you representations for Millikan are not primarily linguistic but they have linguistic examples. One example is we don't eat peas with our fingers as addressed to a little boy. We don't eat peas with our fingers. What are we saying when we say we are not e eating peas with our fingers? We are not just saying that as a matter of fact people or most people or most people most of the time do not eat peas uh, with their fingers, we are also saying that that is as it ought to be. That is, that is uh, uh, the pattern of behavior that the little boy ought to follow. We should not eat peas with our fingers. So, as a matter of fact, people don't. But at the same time, we ought not to eat peas with our fingers. So, as Millikan says, PPRs, put me pull your representations, face both ways. They play both the role of a description and the role of a prescription or not. They are both descriptive and directive, Millikan says. Millikan says that uh, they are not conjunctions of a descriptive and a directive representation, but something more primitive. And she puts forth the uh, perhaps excessive claim that they are in a sense of glue helping to hold human societies together. Well, it is not as outrageous as it looks. If you read, if you read uh, Millikan, she has good reasons to, for, for her statement, but uh, it looks outrageous. Uh, I'm not claiming uh, anything that strong, and I will not go, uh, go into, into the issue at all, but I will limit myself to the following, and I'm coming to uh, my conclusion. Uh, first of all, consider uh, push me pull your statements. They cannot be singled out by their syntactic or logical form. For example, we don't build houses taller than 100 meters, as asserted in my city, Torino, was factually true until a few years ago. But it carried no normative implications, and in fact, it was recently made false to the satisfaction of many people that like very tall buildings, skyscrapers. For a statement to be a true uh, Bullion statement, it seems that two conditions but must be satisfied. First of all, the statement expresses an acceptable, though perhaps rough generalization. For example, it is factually true that most people, most of the time, do not eat peas with their fingers. And secondly, that, that is that most people, do, most of the time, do not eat peas with their fingers, is as it ought to be. If one is satisfied, but two is not, then the statement is not push me pull you. It is just a true factual generalization. While if one is not satisfied, the statement is simply false. And in most cases, the push me pull your reading does not arise at all. Thus, if one were to assert that in Italy we respect public property, that would simply count as a false statement. Similarly, if one were to assert in Italian, cane means cat, that is simply false. Now, uh, if we read statements of meaning, X means cat, as push me pull representations, uh, we can explain why impulse holds, because impulse just 
makes the normative component of the statement explicit. X, mean, X means cat has a normative component if it is a Boolean representation and the consequent X ought to be used only to be applied only to cats brings out that normative component or makes it explicit. But on the other hand, Conv holds, is supposed to hold as well. Why? How can we explain that using the notion of push push me pull your representation or statement? One is tempted uh, to say that really Conv uh, is true because it expresses an inference to the best explanation. Clearly, if you assume that X means cat, then this explains why it ought to be applied only to cats, that's just simple. So you, uh, in a way, you read input backwards and get an inference to the best explanation. But that, of course, would leave it open the possibility that the consequent of con, of con might be false, while the antecedent is true, contrary to the necessary equivalence of both sides. And in fact, there is a much stronger reason why Conn holds. Again, we are assuming that X is a word, uh, so it has some meaning. Otherwise, it would not be a word of the language we are talking about. So suppose it didn't mean cat, but for example, dog. We are talking about Conn. That is, we are talking about the, uh, the, the conditional if X ought to be applied only to cats, then X means cat. So suppose it doesn't mean cat. For example, it means dog. Hence, given the normative component of meaning, it ought to be applied only to dogs. But we're assuming it ought to be applied only to cats. So it remains that X has no application. But even the descriptive component of X means dog, it is not true that it means dog. Because if it has no application, there is no use for X. If there is no use for X, X doesn't mean anything because it has no use. The descriptive component of X means such and such is just not there. So it cannot be true, whatever follows the word. So if you assume that X means can, has both a descriptive and the normative component, we explain why con holds. We also explain why impul holds. So if statements of meaning are put in put representations, they do describe how X is regularly used as use theories insist, but they simultaneously prescribe how X ought to be used. Now, normativity is rooted in use. The moment a use fades or disappears, normativity fades and disappears with it. Hence the futility of linguistic purism that tries, you know, to keep a norm in life when its root is no longer there when its factual basis is no longer there. And similarly, of course, if everybody, if we all started eating peas with our fingers, then the relevant norm of politeness would no longer hold after a while. On the other hand, statements of meanings are not just descriptive of use. If they were, there would be nothing wrong with using that to refer to golden receivers, but we know there is something wrong with that. It would be like with, you know, the two very tall buildings in Turin. There, there was nothing wrong with building two very tall buildings, even though at the time it was factually true that buildings in Turin are not taller than 100 meters. Well, perhaps there was something wrong, but 